Today, I have for you the long-awaited SymPy tutorial in Python. And so, what is SymPy? Well, if you've watched my other videos, you'll probably note that I use SymPy in almost every one of them. The reason I do that is because there's a lot of math in physics, and I don't like doing a lot of math. And I make a lot of mistakes when I do a lot of math. But on a computer, I can guarantee that that math is done correctly provided I know how to use the computer. And the computational language, if you're working in Python of choice, is SymPy. SymPy is a symbolic computing package, meaning that you have symbolic expressions, symbolic integrals, symbolic things you want to take the derivative of, it will do it without the use of plugging in specific values into those expressions. Now, there's probably lots of other SymPy tutorials out there, and you might be wondering, well, why would I stick around to watch an hour of this video? And I'll tell you why. In other tutorial videos, I can guarantee they're not gonna look at problems as deep as this tutorial. In this tutorial, we're gonna look at some Lagrangian mechanics, how to use SymPy to solve complicated problems that would give you a headache trying to do by hand. We'll also look at the hydrogen atom in quantum mechanics and how SymPy can help you find the average distance from the proton of the electron, which involves complicated functions and complicated integrals. Now, in addition to this tutorial, I also have a tutorial on NumPy, which is numerical programming, SciPy, which has a lot of scientific functions, and Matplotlib, which is specifically plotting in Python. So be sure to check out those as well. Anyways, enjoy. The star of the show today is SymPy. That's the first package we import, and we're going to import it as SMP. So whenever we call functions with SymPy, it starts with SMP. We also have NumPy and Matplotlib. I'll use them for a little bit of extra things during this video, but of course they're not going to be the main focus here. And so the first part of SymPy is that it's all based around symbols and operations on symbols because it's a symbolic library. So we can define symbols like this. So here I'm defining a symbol called X. And so if I print it, it just looks like this and it shows up in a nice LaTeX format like that. And we can do operations on symbols like we would normal Python variables. We can square them. Uh, we can you know, take the cosine of X, for example, and it shows up as another expression. That's sort of what I do here. So I can take X squared, it'll show up as something. It'll take simp dot sine x and I can set other variables equal to this. So I can say y is equal to simp dot sine x and I can print y and y shows up like that. So I can also do like y minus x squared. And so y of course is sine x minus x squared and I get things like this. So that's sort of how you play around with symbols in SymPy. And of course I can then make this a new variable called z and I can look at z and it sort of saves the result there. So there's a lot of potential for building up variables doing little things like this. Um, and so there's a lot of different functions in SymPy. So I showed sine x above. Um, I'm just gonna leave that there. But there's obviously a lot more functions. So one way to see how many functions there are in a package, uh, at least in Jupyter Notebook, is I can go simp dot, so, and then I press tab, and tab will autocomplete, and it sort of shows all the functions that I have here. So if you're curious what sort of function SymPy has, I would suggest kind of scrolling through this list. And you might be surprised. You see like, okay, it's got arc, uh, arc cos, arc cos, cotangent, all these things. Uh, there's some airy functions here. Again, you can Google these. The SymPy um, documentation isn't great online. So I would suggest like looking through this list and then sort of Googling these individually. Uh, there's a lot of functions. There's the Bessel functions, of course, um, stuff with calculus. Uh, lots and lots of different things here. So I won't go through all of these obviously in this video, but the point is that you can see that they exist. And if you want to you know, see what one does, for example, you can look up SymPy, just Google SymPy and then for example this, and it should show up what it does. And so this is sort of your uh, list of everything that SymPy can do. So again, just SymPy dot, and then when you're typing, press tab. And it might take a little bit to load, and then it shows all the different things here. I'm going to comment this out because it won't run, but it's a good way of seeing things. So like I said, you can save expressions in new variables. So here I'm setting y a new variable. I defined x above as simpy.symbols x, and I just set it equal to a uh, polynomial. So then I have y, and I can do operations on this new variable. So I can set z is equal to y squared, and I can look up z, and so z looks like this. 
And of course, with a variable Z, there's a lot of different things I can do here. You can see that it's not expanded and it's also not in its factored form, but I can factor this in terms of, you know, if you have a polynomial or a multinomial, you can factor it in terms of its roots. So for example, here I can call Z dot factor and it will express it in terms of products of its roots. So minus one and minus three, those are the roots of this polynomial. Of course, that's the roots of this um, uh, polynomial with order two. Uh, minus one or plus one plus, or minus one and minus three and so it expands it like that and I can also expand it if I want like the full uh, order four uh, polynomial here so then I expand this expression so it'll save it in a format like this in SymPy and typically when you have a variable if you want to do things with it there's like factor and expand and of course like before I can just press tab for autocomplete and it will actually show all the things that I can do with uh, Z so um, as coef exponent, like as coefficient, I can call this method, for example, uh, with brackets. It's not actually implemented for this. I need to give a, an extra variable here, but uh, you know, as poly. So I'm guessing that means as polynomial. And you know, there, there's lots of different things in SymPy here. So again, I would, if you're curious, I would go and explore all these different functions and see what they do. And that'll give you like a really good idea of what's going on in SymPy. And so again, this is a really important thing when you're learning a library in Python is do something like this, Z dot, press the tab key and take a look at all the different functions here, you know, because it's, uh, it's important. So obviously this has two positional arguments and an X. So there's, uh, you know, functions here that you can Google. Um, so there's also something called simp dot solve and it solves F X. So the way this works is that F is a function of X. Right, so f is some variable, just like y here depends on x. There's some variable I have called f that depends on x, and this will find the value of x that makes f of x equals zero. So for example, z I know is equal to this expression here, z depends on x. So I solve for the value of x, this is important, that makes z equals zero, right? Because f is just an expression, f isn't an equation. But SymPy assumes that whatever this expression is on the left hand side is equal to zero. And whenever you have an equation of like, you know, y equals or p equals q, then you can always rearrange that to p minus q equals zero. So any equation you have can always be written as an expression equals zero. So that's important when you're doing stuff with SymPy. You always want to make sure that this on the left hand side is some expression that equals zero. So that's what I'm doing. So I say, I want to solve Z, this up here equals zero. I call simple solve Z X and it will find the, the values that will make it zero. I can also write explicit functions here. So here I'm giving a function simp dot sign X. So I look here, F is equal to sign X and I want to find X that makes F X equals to zero. And it gives me zero and pi, which are exactly the answers that you want. Now there's a few things that are really good practice in SymPy, and that's that if you know things about your variable X when you're defining it, so suppose you know that X is a real number, this is huge in SymPy, maybe you know that it's positive and not negative, maybe you know that it's an integer, it's really good to specify it when you define that variable, because it turns out, and I'll show later in this video, when you have really complex operations that you're doing with variables, if it, you don't assume that it's real or an integer or whatever, SymPy will sort of blow up in the solutions that it gives because it will say, well, if it's complex and here and if it's real or whatever. So it's good to specify these before getting into anything complicated. You want to put all the assumptions about your variables into SymPy. So for example, here, if I just write simp, uh, symbols x, this is a really basic example. And I'm solving the polynomial x squared plus one, which of course has no real roots and I go like this, it will give minus i and i as the roots, which of course is the answer to this, but this is in the complex plane. But suppose I'm not interested in complex answers, I'm only interested in the real solutions. Well then when I define x, I assume that it's real, and then I can solve it, and it will give no solutions. So again, this is a really simple case outlining this, but as I'll show later, it's really important to do this when you're dealing with more complicated examples. So this is the importance of defining the properties of your variable. And maybe you know that it's positive too, right? So suppose I know that positive is true and I'm solving the equation um, x plus four is equal to zero, right? It will give no solutions here. But if I didn't put positive is equal to true, well, obviously the solution to this is x equals negative four. So it will give that answer. 
So this is another basic example where I can put in more and more uh, properties of this and it will um, sort of define it like this. I can also, if I'm dealing with lots of variables, I can define them all at once. So here I'm defining three at the same time, x, y, z is equal to sim dot symbols, x, y, z. So this, and you'll notice I have a space here. So this defines three symbols altogether. And then I, you know, have some new variable f is equal to sort of a combination of x squared plus sine z times y. And I can look at f. So I've defined three variables at once. I've written an expression in terms of those. And now I'm just looking at this expression f. And that's my uh, expression here, x squared plus y times sine z. And if I have multivariable expressions that have three variables, I can also specify which variable I want to solve for. So suppose I want to solve f is equal to zero and I want to find the value of x that makes f equal to zero. Well, I say I want to find the value of x that makes f this whole thing equal to zero. This is my x solution. And there's two values for this. It's x equals minus the square root of y, y times sine z. Of course, I just this is simple to solve by hand. I just move y sine z to the left hand side. x squared equals minus y sine z and then I take the square root and there's plus or negative of that. So it will give me minus y sine z uh, or plus the square root of minus y sine z. And if I substitute either of these in x here, I get f equals zero. So this is solving for the specific x value. Uh, I can also solve for the specific y value, right? Because there's a value of y in terms of x and z that make this equal to zero. And so that's just minus x squared sine z. So this whole expression equal to zero, I solve for y. Right, this occurs a lot when you're solving for a particular variable in physics, and it gives me the value of y that sets this equal to zero. Same thing with z. There's a few different values of z that make this expression equal to zero. Now, sometimes you have a SymPy expression that's symbolic, but you want to convert it into a numerical function so you can actually plot it in matplotlib, for example. So that's a really important part of SymPy that I feel like a lot of people don't understand. They think of SymPy as one thing and NumPy as another but there's a connection between the two and that's using lambda phi. You can take a SymPy expression and turn it into a numerical function so you can plot it on a computer. So here I'm gonna take the first Z solution here, the arc sine of X squared divided by Y. So I just index it because this is an array. This is the zeroth element and this is the first element. So X solves zero gives me the first element here. And I have my expression as a SymPy expression. Now, if I want to lambda -fy it, if I want to turn it into a function where I pass numbers into it and it gives a value, for example, like x equals one, y equals two, like a normal Python function, I do uh, expression underscore f. I always in my videos use underscore f for a numerical function. This means something that I pass numbers to and it returns a number. This is like general functions on a computer. And I call simp.lambda -fy. And the way that this function works, this lambda -fy, is it's creating a numerical function. So the arguments that it takes in are x and y, and the expression that I'm lambda -fying is the expression here above. So this is the symbolic expression, and these are the symbols that are part of that expression. And it will create a function expression f, and that function takes in x and y, and it returns the value of this expression. So for example, here I create expression f, and I call expression f with the value one, two, and it just returns a normal number like in Python. So it's just a function that takes an x, y, and it returns a number. And so then I can do normal Python operations on this, right? This is a function that I can pass arrays to numpy arrays and do plotting. So here I give a hundred values of X between zero and one. So I have a linear space in X. Uh, the value of Y I'm gonna plug in here is Y equals two. And then I plot X versus this expression F, which is a numerical function. And I pass in X and Y, right? Cause this is an array here. If I just look at this, it's an array of X values and Y is just a number. So then I'm plugging in this array and this value of Y and this will also return an array because it's like a normal Python function and I can plot here. So I'm taking a SymPy expression, I'm turning it into a numerical function where I can then do operations on it. And of course this is pretty typical. You wanna do your algebra, right, in SymPy, you turn it into a numerical thing and then you can do stuff like solve differential equations, get numerical solutions to expressions, various things like that. That's the general workflow in most of my videos on this channel. And it's typically the workflow in many physics problems. Now, alternatively, you could just substitute explicit values in. So I'm calling F and I'm substituting the value. So here's my expression F and I can substitute specific values in here. So suppose I wanna substitute Y and uh, Z here. Y equals three, Z is equal to pi over two. Then I set it up like this. I have F dot subs and I have this array 
and I pass in pairs. So the first pair is y and the value three. The second pair is the value z and the value pi over two. And we'll substitute in y equals three and z equal to the pi over two. So this is one uh, x squared plus three. So that's sort of how this works. I can also put uh, numbers in here. So I, for example, I could substitute y and I wanna put the value um, uh, cos z, wherever y is. So what that means is wherever y shows up in this expression, I'm gonna put the value cosine of z there. So it substitutes cosine z into y. So I have x squared plus cos z sine z. And then I put pi over two and sine pi over two is one, but cos pi over two is zero. So it puts, so first thing it does is this, it puts cos z, so cos z sine z. And then if I put pi over two into cos z sine z, one of them is equal to zero. So I just get x squared. But you know, suppose I put z and I can put anywhere there's a z, put a y for example. So think about what that would do. And then I'll explain what happens is that you put y, um, wherever there's a y, put cos z. So I get x squared plus cos z sine z. And then whenever there's a z, I put y. So then it turns cos z sine z into cos y sine y. Sort of like this. So it does this substitution first, and then it does this substitution. So that's sort of the substitution of variables in symbolic expressions in SymPy. So let's look at some actual useful and somewhat complicated uh, physics examples here in SymPy. Things that would be a little bit difficult to do by hand. So there's a falling object. I just drop it. It falls under the force of gravity. In fact, I don't drop it. I give it an initial velocity. So it's uh, equation of motion is h naught of t is equal to h naught, where you drop it from, plus that minus that initial velocity times time minus one half gt squared. So I'm throwing an object down and then it's falling under the force of gravity. And there's a platform that's accelerating upwards that comes to meet this object. So I sort of throw this down and there's a platform that's coming up and I throw it and they meet each other. And the question is, and this is a somewhat complicated question, find the initial velocity that I throw down this object, right? So I'm throwing it down and this thing's coming up such that when they collide, they're moving at the same speed. So there's two things I need to solve for here. I need to solve for v naught, the initial speed that I drop it at, and I need to solve for t, the time when they collide. And so there's two equations here that need to be satisfied. h naught of t equals hp of t. Of course, when they collide, the objects are at the same height. And the t is the time where they collide. The second equation is that the velocity of the falling object is minus the velocity of the platform moving up. That means they're colliding at the same speed and t is the time where they collide. And so I'm, I have two equations, the heights are equal, the velocities are equal, and I have two unknowns, the time when they collide and then initial velocity. And I need to solve for both of those. So I have two equations that are sort of like this, they're somewhat complicated, it would be annoying to write this all out, and two variables. So of course in SymPy, like I said, when we have equations that we need to solve, we need to write something is equal to zero. And that's sort of what I have here. So I have equation one equals zero, equation two equals zero. So I have many equations and many unknowns. So what I'm doing here is I'm solving multiple equations with multiple unknowns. So my first equation, I convert this is equal to expression equals zero. So h naught of t minus hp of t equals zero. Same thing with the second equation, the velocities equals zero. So let's define the symbols that we have here. So I define multiple symbols at once. Uh, t, h naught, v naught, g, v, p, and q. These are all the variables that show up in this equation here. And I define them as t and I space them apart. h naught, v naught, g, v, p, q, like I showed how to define above. They're all real and they're all positive in this case, right? Every one of these is positive. So good practice, like I said, define the properties of your variables that you have. So I define all my symbols. Then I define the expressions that I have, right? So I have my object and my platform. So my object, h naught, as a function of t is equal to h naught minus v naught t. Um, when I have fractions in SymPy, it's typically good practice to use simp dot rational as opposed to one divided by two, because one divided by two is like an operation on a computer, whereas simp dot rational makes sure that it's specifically one divided by two. It doesn't matter in most cases, but it's again, it's good practice. So again, if I do simp dot rational, one four, it gives me like the perfect one fourth fraction, whereas one divided by four, well, this is a computer operation that gives 0 0.25. So again, good practice here. Uh, times gt squared, um, the derivative, of course, I'll show how to take derivatives in SymPy in a bit, but for now, 
It's just the derivative of this expression. So uh, take the derivative with respect to time. I get uh, GT minus V naught and same thing with HP. That's the function of the platform. Uh, again, I just substitute the expression here and the velocity of that. So now I have all my expressions and I can look at them. H naught of T. I have my expression that I defined above, uh, dHp dt, uh, the expression I have above. So all my uh, functions here are defined as sympy variables. Uh, next thing we need to do is define these equations. So I need to define what's on the left-hand side of these equations so I can solve them. So equation one is h naught of t minus hp of t, which I've defined above. And equation two is the sum of these uh, velocities here. And again, I can look at these equations and uh, they're sort of complicated. They're just quadratic equations, but again, it's, it's uh, sort of shows up in SymPy nicely here. And now I wanna solve these equations. So this is where it gets a little bit complicated. So I wanna solve equation one and equation two, right? These are my two equations that I have above. And I wanna solve for time and V naught. These are the two unknowns, the time when they collide and the initial velocity that makes them collide at the same speed. And so if I just call simp.solve these two things here, right? I get this expression here. Now I need to index zero because it will give all the different uh, pairs of solutions. So there's only one pair of solution and that's zero. That's the right. Cause maybe there's multiple pairs of T and V naught that make this equal to true. Well, in this case, there's only a unique T and a unique V naught. So there's only one pair. So this is the first pair. And if I want T, which is the first thing I'm solving for, I index zero and that gives me the value of T. And if I want, uh, the velocity, I would index one, and that gives me the velocity. That's just the order that I give them in here. So that's what I'm doing here, rather than indexing zero and one, um, right? Because this is a tuple, so there's one element here, second element here. Whenever I have a tuple with, say, two elements, one, two, for example, I can go um, just use dummy variables, uh, g, h, rather uh, g h equals one two i can set g and h equal like a tuple like that and then i can look at g and the value is one and h and the value is two so that's what i'm doing here this is like g h so my t collision v init fall is equal to the solution and i remember that this is a tuple here so i substitute this right here and it's just like what's happening above here with g and h and I say t collide v and it falls equal to this. So that's, it's a little bit of a complicated Python expression, but it's, it's an easy way of doing stuff with tuples and I can find my initial speed. So this is the speed I need to throw it down. If I know the acceleration of the platform such that when they collide, they collide at the same speed. Another, so that's the initial velocity when they fall. Another question you might ask is what is the velocity when they collide with each other? Well, for that, I need to do some substitution of variables. So for that, I substitute in the time when they collide t collide, which of course I can look at above here as well. So I substitute this into t and I substitute this into v naught. And again, this is where stuff starts to get mathemath. And again, this is where stuff starts to get mathematically complicated. Substituting these two expressions into these equations is not going to be very fun to do, but in SymPy it's very simple. So I substitute the collision time into t and the initial velocity that I throw it down at as well, um, and I can substitute. And by the way, if I just do this, it's sort of complicated expression here. It's always good to call simplify. So if I have a variable, this whole thing is a variable. I call simplify, it will make it a little bit simpler. And I get this expression here. And I do the same thing for the platform. Well, the platform should be the opposite velocity, right? Uh, if this is negative, then this should be everything but positive. So I do the same thing for DHP, the platform DT, and I call simplify and I've like lo and behold, I get the positive version of this expression up here. So we've correctly solved this problem. That's a simple physics problem, but you can see where SymPy really comes in handy for, you know, not having to do annoying and complicated math. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about calculus in SymPy. And if you don't know, I already have an entire video. There should be a link above for first year calculus in Python. A big portion of that video is using SymPy for calculus expressions. And uh, that's sort of the sample that I took in this video. But if you want a full in-depth discussion of that, please be sure to check out that video. That video also goes over some of the numerical things that you can do with first year calculus as well. So not only does that video cover SymPy, it also covers, well, maybe you have an integral that can't be evaluated, or maybe you have things like that. And then it shows how to do that stuff in NumPy. 
But you can do this stuff in SymPy. So I'm defining a symbol x. And if I want to take a limit like this, of course, this is all basically definition. I call simp.limit. I pass the expression I have, which is this expression here. And I'm taking x to pi, right? And I get my limit. Uh, derivatives are very similar. So I'm taking the derivative of this expression here. Again, it would be sort of annoying to do by hand. This is kind of annoying uh, expression to differentiate. So I take the simp.diff, that gives me the derivative. My expression is here and I'm differentiating it with respect to x and that gives me my derivative. Now the really useful part of SymPy, and this comes in handy with things like Lagrangian mechanics, is that you can do the sort of stuff with abstract functions. So here f and g are abstract functions, but suppose I have an expression like this, and I wanna take the derivative of this with respect to x. And this is where it's important to sort of pay attention. So I define my f and g like I would normal SymPy symbols, but I give this additional parameter class equals SymPy.function. So let's look what happens if I just do this by itself. If I look at f and g, You'll note that that's not a latex symbol. They're just sort of text symbols. So right now they're sort of like undefined functions and I need to specify what they're functions of, right? And I know that they're functions of X, both are functions of X. So I say um, G is equal to G of X. So G is a function of X. F is a function of X plus G. That's the argument that goes into F in this case. So F is equal to F of X plus G. I can look at f and it's sort of the same expression that you see up above here. So g is g of x, f is f of x plus g. So those are the arguments that go into these functions. And I can actually differentiate this. So I say, well, I'm gonna call ddx on this function. So I sim.diff fx, I set that equal to a variable called dfdx and then I look at dfdx and I get the derivative and it's just um, the, the uh, chain rule, I'm guessing. I think that's what it's called. It's not the product rule, it's the chain rule. So then I get ddx of, um, it's the derivative of the argument inside, ddx of g of x plus one, plus the, and then the chain rule says also times the derivative of f. And it's evaluated at the value of x plus g of x. So that gives sort of this dummy variable here. And so I have this uh, derivative and I can then substitute a specific value into g. And so I'm just gonna comment this out here and I'll explain what this does in a sec. So I'm differentiating or I'm substituting the value Wherever I see a g, I'm gonna put the value sine x. Like I said, that's how dot subs works. We went over that earlier in the video. And if I just call this, you'll see that it actually isn't taking the derivative of sine x. It's just sort of putting it in here. It hasn't actually done anything. So if I wanted to take derivatives after substituting things in, if you see something like this in SymPy, you should always check, well, have I called dot do it? And do it will make sure that all derivatives or anything that's going on in the problem is actually done. So here I call dot do it, and then it takes the derivative of sine x and it's cos x plus one. Of course, you still don't know what the um, functional value of f is in this case. And so it, have, it hasn't done that. So it leaves it in this abstract form. So that's sort of really important with SymPy. And at the end of the video, I'll go over Lagrangian mechanics a bit. And this is super, super helpful that SymPy can deal with functions in this abstract sense. Now, of course, there's many integrals that are sort of a pain to do by hand in uh, SymPy. So here's the integral of cos cosecant times cotangent of x. It will check to make sure that this integral can be done um, analytically. If not, it just won't run. It'll continue running forever. So here I can call this just sim.integrate. I give the integrand uh, cosecant x times cotangent of x, and then I pass the value of x. This gives the integral. And of course, it never gives the plus c. So whenever you're evaluating integrals in SymPy, Note there's no plus C, they just sort of omit that, but really you should be adding a plus C. If, For example, you're doing a, a indefinite integral on a test or something. I can also do definite integrals where there's actually bounds to the integral. So here I'm uh, integrating this expression from zero to ln four. I give the integrand here. I give the bounds X goes from zero to uh, log four. You'll note that this sort of comes as like a tuple. So my variable X, uh, bounds, lower bound zero, upper bound uh, log of four, and it evaluates this integrand here, and it will just integrate it and give the uh, corresponding expression. Uh, this integral would be really annoying to do by hands. I think you would need to do um, integration by parts over and over and over again to evaluate it. Uh, you also note something special with this integral, it goes from one to t, so one of the bounds is actually 
uh, not specified. This is still a definite integral. It's just with like a, a symbolic bound here. So I define my symbol T and I can integrate the integrand uh, like this and I'm evaluating from X goes from one to T. So T is sort of arbitrary here um, and I can get the value. And of course it's just a very long polynomial here, um, but much easier than doing this by hand. So this is a case where, especially whenever you have exponentials and polynomial terms and you don't want to go look into um, integral tables or whatever, or you don't want to type into Wolfram Alpha, if you learn this sort of way of doing integrals in SymPy, it will make doing assignments in physics especially very easy because it's very easy to make mistakes as well when you're dealing with annoying things like this. So um, I would highly recommend you know learning to do this quick because even for myself, expressions, uh, integral expressions that show up when I'm doing assignments in grad school, it's so much easier for me to evaluate them in SymPy as opposed to doing them by hand because I make lots of mistakes by hand. I'm not the greatest at taking integrals by hand, but on a computer, very easy. And you don't have to worry about making mistakes. So I wanted to give a really good example here because a lot of the time what happens in tutorial videos is they give really basic things and then they don't really do anything with it. And they don't show how to start from the basics and actually do problems that mean something or that are difficult and that sort of challenge your brain. So I'm gonna give a good example here. This is a fantastic example using SymPy. And for those of you that have taken quantum mechanics in physics, uh, this will make sense. For those of you who haven't, don't worry about that. Uh, it doesn't matter. You just sort of accept what I say. So there's the hydrogen wave function. This is the wave function that sort of gives the positional probability of the electron around the proton in an atom. And so if I square this value here, right? So if psi NLM, if I square this, it's a function of R, theta, and phi. Those are spherical coordinates. Um, and it gives a probability density of being somewhere in space, right? So the electron in an atom isn't confined to an orbit. There's a probability of measuring it somewhere in space. So I take this, I square it, and that gives me, it's proportional to the probability density function. So the question is, what are these functions? R, N, L of R, and this Y, L, M. So this is the spherical harmonics. Uh, this is the radial part. You'll notice it's a separation of variables thing here. It's sort of handy for the um, eigenstates of uh, the electron, the energy eigenstates. And so uh, RNL of R, it's a complicated expression here, and we're going to define it in SymPy. So it's a function of N. A here is the Bohr radius. This is just a number. It's a distance. Um, you know, it's got a numerical value. It's fine. N and L are integers. So this will come in handy for how we define symbols in SymPy. So N and L are integers, like 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, 0. N is sort of um, the energy of the electron. So those gives the shells of the electron. Uh, L has to do with the angular momentum of the electron, but they're integers. That's sort of the quanta of quantum mechanics. So N and L are integers in this expression. A is just a, a number. Uh, R over NA, R is the radius, the distance from the proton in the atom. Uh, to RNA, so N and L again, like our integers. And this here, um, this is an associated Laguerre plot polynomial. This shows up, it's just the solution to a differential equation. When you solve the uh, Schrodinger equation, this is just the function that is the solution. So it's a polynomial, and it depends on these two parameters here. It's sort of shown like this. These are just two like arguments that you give to this uh, Laguerre polynomial, and it will return a certain polynomial in X, and then I substitute 2R over NA, that's the argument you give to it. So this is R and L of R. And so from this long expression here, I can find the mean distance of the electron from the atom at a particular value of N, which is the energy and angular momentum of the electron as uh, the sum. And by the way, this integral goes from zero to infinity, spherical coordinates. I just haven't explicitly uh, written it that there. And it's uh, R and L squared times R cubed dr. And if you're curious how to derive that, check out Griffith's book, but this is just an expression. We're going to evaluate this in SymPy. And again, doing this by hand, not a lot of fun, right? You wanna do this by hand, that's a real headache. SymPy, two seconds, very easy to do. And the standard deviation in distance, meaning sort of the, the spread in, if I measure the position of the electron over and over, what's the sort of um, spread of where it shows up as a distance from the proton? It's sort of like the standard deviation. If you measure the heights of a lot of people in the population, what's the uh, spread in heights? This is like the spread in measuring the electron from the atom. Uh, 
It's just given by this expression here. So the integral is 0 to infinity of RNL squared r to the 4 dr minus 0 to infinity RNL squared r cubed dr squared. So again, solving these integral by hand, not a lot of fun, but simpy, very easy. So the first thing we notice that we have this associated Laguerre polynomial in R and L of R. We're going to define this first. So we need to import it. So this is a just a function from SymPy. Um, associated Laguerre. And I can look at the arguments it takes. So it takes in a value. You notice when it's used, it takes in two values and then x. And so these two values are these numbers here, n minus l minus 1 and 2l plus 1. That gives what the polynomial actually looks like, the, the structure of the polynomial. And then x, in this case, is just 2r divided by na. So that's how you would sort of define this Laguerre polynomial. And it shows that if I give associated Laguerre, um, first value is 2, second value is a, x, it will give an expression that looks like this. So it's just a, a, a general polynomial in uh, you know basic math. So it looks like a scary function. They're just polynomials of uh, our 2r divided by na. So let's define our variables and be very specific. I told you that r and a, they're real and they're positive. r is the distance from the um, center or from the proton. And a is just some real number. It's just a distance. But I'm going to specify it as a variable in this problem. So they're real and positive. Uh, n and l... I define them as well. I make sure that to define that they're integers and that they're also positive. So the assumptions of my variables have been put in here. And then I define R and L of R, which is this big expression here. So it's sort of a big thing that I define. And I'm just using SymPy for all the functions. So I take the square root. You'll note that this square root here. Um, and you can check this on your own. But I'm just doing 2 over Na cubed. I use the sim dot factorial. That's for taking the factorial of n minus l minus 1 here. I divide. I make sure I have the right brackets to make sure this looks all good. I multiply by the ex exponential and this factor here. And then I use my associated Laguerre polynomial. The first argument is n minus l minus 1. That corresponds to sort of this here. The second is 2l plus 1. That's what this is up here. And the actual um, you know value of x in that polynomial is 2r divided by n times a. And I can look at r. And sure enough, this expression that you see in SymPy here is equal to this here. So whenever you define something like this, you want to make sure it corresponds to things that you know, right? Like I have this up here. We don't know if it's really correct yet because it sort of looks different. So I'm going to find the ground state, the radial function of the ground state of hydrogen. So for that, I'm going to substitute n is equal to 1. That's the ground state energy. And l is equal to 0. That's the ground state radial wave function of hydrogen. So that's R10. And I can look at this function. And then you can look at a table and you can say, ah, yes, well, this is the ground state function. So I have a good um, confidence that I define my terms correctly. And as a matter of fact, when I was setting this up, I was making mistakes. And it, I used this to correct defining this expression properly. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write a function that computes the uh, integral 0 to infinity of RNL squared r to the k. And you might be saying, well, what the heck is k? Why would I define it as k? Well, look what shows up here. I have r cubed and r to the 4. And as you get like sort of higher and higher order statistics, larger and larger values of r will show up. So if you're doing a more complicated analysis, uh, you would need higher values of r because they show up in integrals. So instead of doing 4 and 3 separately, I'm going to define it as abstractly as k. And then I can substitute a value of k in and it will evaluate for that value of k. So how does this work? I'm actually defining a Python function here that takes in SymPy you know, symbols and does something. So it takes an nVal. So nVal is like 1 or 0 or 2. It's like an actual integer that I'm plugging in here, right? So maybe I want to do this for 2, 1, that radial wave function. So it takes in that. It takes in a value of lVal, and it takes in k. And so it, it, these are actual integers that I'm going to substitute in my expression, right? So I take r and l. I substitute n as nVal. So nVal, like kind of like 1 here. L is L val, so that would be like 0 up here. And I integrate R and L squared times R to the K as R goes from 0 to infinity. So again, that's sort of like up here, right? I can give him like, say N val was 2 and L val was 1. What it will do is it will return an expression like this. And then it can integrate that expression. Same thing if I give like 4 and 3. It will return a, an expression like this and it will integrate that expression. 
And what's nice is I can give any values of nval, L, lval, and k, and it will actually evaluate it very easily instead of having to do it by hand every time. This is the whole idea of analyses in Python is that you make it as simple and easy as possible for you to compute everything you need. So if I wanted to do this for all different radial wave functions and different values of k, I was computing lots of statistics, I wanna write a function that does everything for me in one little blip of code. Right, so now I can compute this integral. So here I'm doing it for n equals one, l equals zero, and k equals three. That will give me the um, mean distance and l, right? k equals three, this gives me the mean distance for a particular energy state of the electron. So here n one zero, this gives me the mean distance of the state psi one zero zero, the ground state, right? I can also find the mean distance for any state. I can do it for like the fourth excited energy state, 24a. What happens if I change the value of l? Well, I get different values of a, was there more angular momentum, right? Uh, 18a, and then I can put like three and one, for example. So here I'm finding k equals three always means that uh, you have r cubed here. So that always gives me the mean distance. If I want the standard deviation, I put k equals four minus k equals three, this integral squared square root. That's just this expression here. It's very simple. So here, for example, I'm finding the uh, spreading distances for the ground state, n equals one, l equals zero, k equals four, and then the other one squared. And so this is the standard deviation of where I sort of measure the electron uh, from the center of the atom. So this is sort of the spread in distances. So ideally, the spread, if you were thinking of a classical orbit of an electron, the spread would be zero if I measure it over and over and over again. But because it's quantum mechanics, it doesn't always show up as the same radial distance. The Bohr model, right, predicts the same distance every time. It's just an orbit like this. But quantum mechanics says, no, there's a spread in these distances and it's equal to root three A over two. And like I said up before, I compute the mean radial distance in a state four, two, zero. And I can sort of do this here and it will give me 21 A. Now, there's a lot of interesting extensions to this. So if you're going through this video, you're typing out the code, what I would sort of suggest doing is, well, why don't you automate a function that uses lambda phi, that converts it to a numerical function, I showed how to do that above, where you plot what the radial distance is away from the atom as n increases. And you can make a plot like that, and you can see, well, is it linear? Does it decrease linearly as the energy goes up? Does it, is it quadratic? Is it cubic? or whatever, and there you would probably substitute A equals one. So you're just measuring it in terms of Bohr distances. And you can say, well, let's go from like N equals uh, one to 10. How does that mean distance from the atom look? So I was a little curious myself, so I actually wrote a function that does that here. So it takes in an nval, and it's always gonna be L equals zero. So it looks at the different energy states of the um, atom. Uh, L is always equal to zero. So I evaluate my uh, expression. Um, and uh, so I compute the integral and uh, L val k equals three. So it's finding the mean distance. Uh, I lambda -fy this expression. It, the argument is a, of course, because it will always depend only on a, this distance. And uh, the expression that I evaluate, this expression will sort of look like uh, 21a or root three a over two or something. And then I'm just gonna substitute in, in this numerical expression, a is equal to one. And I can define this and I can compute the mean distance and it will return a number. So here I'm gonna say, uh, ground state 1.5, right? It's three over two A, uh, two, six A, three, 13.5 A, four, 24 A. And so I can get in a number of Ns, N is equal to MP dot range, uh, 110. And I'm gonna compute, I'm gonna say Ds is equal to, and I'm just gonna use list comprehension here, compute mean distance uh, Ni, for and I in ends. So I made it only from one to 10 and I have a curve that sort of looks like this. And I'm gonna do a scatter plot because it's not continuous, it's quantum mechanics. And it almost looks quadratic. And so because the energy of the electron is proportional to one divided by N squared, there's sort of an inverse relationship between the energy and the distance from the atom. So that's sort of an interesting result that I'll sort of let you explore a little bit on your own. So there's also multivariable calculus you can do in SymPy. And again, I have a video, link above, second year calculus in Python. And again, this focuses a little bit on SymPy and a little bit on NumPy for numerical stuff. 
But uh, this is sort of a sample of the SimPy stuff in that video. But if you're really curious about the true power of SimPy in multivariable calculus, I would highly suggest checking out that video, you know, mark it down to watch after this video because it will give you a great perspective on how to do complicated second year calculus problems using both SimPy and NumPy. So here I'm defining a bunch of variables at once. Uh, you know, I'm just sort of, it'll be used in future problems here. I can define vectors as simp.matrix. I give an array of u1, u2, u3. These are variables. So two vectors here, u and v. I can look at them and they just sort of show up as vectors like this, right? And I define them explicitly like that. Uh, I can do vector addition, right? I can do dot product. I can do cross product. I can do norm. And by the way, this is obviously pretty obvious. You know these formulas, but when you have, when, for example, u2 is a complicated expression, and u1 and v2 and all these things are like big long functions you want to take a cross product that's really annoying to do by hand very easy to do in simpy uh, the norm like this so uh, there's expressions like the projection of u along v or whatever and I, I can find that and it will give the formula for that again when these are complicated expressions very handy uh, i can define lines so like a vector r is a function of t um, is equal to R naught plus T times V. That's sort of the expression for a line in space. Uh, here I give the point R naught, the point uh, V, and I can sort of define a line like that. Same thing with planes. Uh, I give a value of P naught, which is a point, a uh, value of N, which is a normal vector, and I can do N dot P naught minus R, which is exactly this formula for a plane in space, and I get something that looks like this. Uh, for vector calculus, I can take uh, vector derivatives. So here I'm defining a vector that's a function of t, so like 3t sine t, t squared. This is a um, curve in space, one dimension. And uh, it's a one dimensional curve in three dimensional space. And I can differentiate this with respect to t and it will automatically take the derivative with respect to t and all of the coordinates. So an interesting uh, function here, so I have r here as this vector. And maybe I want to find the angle between the velocity and the acceleration as a function of time. So theta is theta of t. So I define v and a is the derivative of r with respect to t, a is the derivative of v with respect to t. And uh, then I take the uh, angle and the angle is just the uh, dot product v dot a divided by the norm of each vector. That's the formula for the angle between two vectors. You can find theta. And it gives this sort of expression here. So again, it theta is sort of a complicated expression. And I can find theta at particular values. So I can substitute t is equal to 6, and it will give me a number. And if I just substitute this in on its own, it will plug in uh, 6 to t. So whenever there's a t, replaces it with the number 6, something like this. But if I want it as a float in Python, I would call dot eval f. That's another way to express something as a number in SimPy. And then it will actually give me a number like this. Uh, I can also take vector integrals. So we'll take the integral of each term in a vector. So here I have a number r like this, and I want the integral of this, the integral of this, and the integral of this, all as a um, vector. So that's like a vector integral. So I integrate r, um, and I integrate it with respect to t. By the way, there's only one variable here, so I don't need to do it. Always good practice to put the variable that you're integrating with respect to. Again, if I don't do this, it will just do something like this. I say, I want you to actually do it, right? SimPy will be as lazy as possible. So I say, do it. And that will do all the derivatives and all the integrals that are going on. And I get my integral. So it's just the integral of this with respect to t, integral of this with respect to t, integral of that with respect to t. That is by definition what a vector integral is. Uh, in some cases, integrals can't be solved analytically. And again, this is what I really go into depth in my second year in calculus video but I'll sort of show you briefly what I mean by this. Cause I've talked a little bit about this numerical stuff in this video. It's not the focus, but it's good to go over. over. So I'm importing something from SciPy. This is a different library called quad vec. What that will do is it will take a vector expression and it will numerically integrate all those things. So what am I doing here? Well, um, let's sort of break it apart because there's a lot of code going on. So this is just me importing the library. And I define a matrix R like this, and I can look at R and it's equal to this. And you can't integrate this analytically. So we're going to do numerical integral. So what I do is I lambda -fy this function, like I talked about above, where it just becomes a Python function. So actually I'm going to call this RF because that's my normal thing that I do. 
So I have a function rf, right? And so this is just a normal Python function where I can give a value of t. So I give a value, for example, t equals one, and it returns uh, a function like this. So it's a function that returns a vector, right? And with a numerical function, I can do a numerical integral. And so then I call quad vec, which does a vector integral in SciPy. That's what this function does. And I integrate this um, numerical function from zero to one. And I take this and uh, let me just call this RF. If I don't do this, by the way, it'll just do the integral and it will give the integral and the error on the integral, but I just want the integral. And so it looks like this. So this is sort of the mix of using SymPy to create a numerical function in Python and then actually do an integral afterwards and get these values. There are other things in multivariable calculus as well, like arc length. So this is the expression for arc length. And for example, maybe I want to find the arc length of a particular vector, zero t, t squared from t equals zero to t equals one. Well, I define my uh, value r here. So here's exactly what I define above, right? My path in space. And then I take the derivative of that with respect to t and I take the norm. And that's exactly what this expression is here because this is x of t, this is y of t, this is z of t. So again, it's like using this functionality really nice. I take the derivative. So here I get dx dt, dy dt, dz dt, and I take the norm of the velocity, which is what this is here, and I get my integrand. And then I can integrate this integrand. So this is the integrand, and I'm integrating from t goes from zero to one, just like a regular integral, and I get my value here. So this is an interesting example. I actually have a video on my channel for a complicated wire, like a general wire in space. What's the magnetic field of that wire? And using what we've done above, I'm gonna show sort of a basic example of a case where you can find the integral um, analytically. Of course, if you can't find it analytically, you have to do some numeric stuff, which is what I do in that video. There's a link to that video above. And so the magnetic field at a point in space R, so you have some complicated wire and you're at a point X, Y, Z, that's R. So R is X, Y, Z, and there's a wire going on in space. The magnetic field at that point R is equal to the following integral, dl dt cross R minus L, R minus L dt. So dt is a parameter of a vector L. So L depends on T. So R is just your point in space. L is equal to F of T, G of T, H of T. By the way, T is not time, T is a parameter that specifies where you are along this line. So if I want to integrate all along this line, I integrate along T. That's how you integrate along curves in space. It's a 1D curve in 3D space. So what I'm doing in this integral is I'm integrating along L. That's what going over T means. So I'm going all along F of T, G of T, H of T. R is constant. R is just your fixed point in space where you are and L sort of goes along like this. And I'm integrating along L and I'm finding sort of this value at all different values of t and I integrate and I get the total magnetic field at this point. So here I define my symbols, x, y, z, that's my point in space. Uh, t is just the parameter, i is the current, mu naught is this uh, sort of physical constant out front. I have my symbols, these are all real, so I'm specifying what they are. Then I have these functions, f of t, g of t, of h of t, so I specify them as simpy functions. And then I sort of do this here to make sure they're functions. Then I define R, L, and DL, DT. Well, you'll note F nicely written as F of T, same with G and H. X, Y, Z are just constants because that's like your constant point in space. So here I define R, L, and DL, DT. So R is the matrix X, Y, Z. L is a matrix F, G, H, and DL, DT, which shows up in this integral is sim.diff L. So if I define these, I can look at these. So R, X, Y, Z, like I want. L, which shows up here in this integral and here is just F of T, G of T, H of T dl dt looks like this. Now I want to find this, integra uh, this integrand. So I substitute all these expressions in here to find this integrand. So the integrand, which I'm going to define as db dt, this is a vector. You'll note that there's a cross product above here and then this is just a constant. So this is a vector integral like I did above. So this db dt is a vector. So it's i times dl dt here, cross r minus l over the norm squared. Look how easy that is. DL dt cross R minus L divided by the norm. Uh, I forgot to square it. I believe it is squared. Um, maybe it's not. So in this expression, I make sure to square the norm and I get my integrand. And it's a complicated expression here. And you might think, well, why do I have this in this form? 
Well, once I have this, I can substitute in specific values of F, G, and H to get a specific wire, and then I can find the integral. So for example, here I have maybe a wire loop, and I want to find the magnetic field at distance H above the central axis of that ring. The ring is radius R. I'm in the center of the ring at distance H above. And so here I make values R and H. These are also sent by symbols. And I substitute F is equal to R cos T, G is R sine T, H is zero. So these are my functions here. So F is my sort of X um, of T in space, G is Y of T. So R cos T, R sine T from T equals zero to two pi gives a circle in space. That's sort of the vector of a circle. H is zero because the ring is at Z equals zero. Uh, then I'm on the central axis of the ring. So X equals zero, Y equals zero, my uh, sort of point space and Z is a distance H above the ring. And I substitute these in and I do the integral and I simplify and I get, or I don't do the integral yet, I just simplify the integrand and my integrand looks like this. Then I can actually find the magnetic field, uh, my constant out front and I integrate the integrand. This is a vector integral, right? dB dt is a vector that looks like this. And I go from T is equal to zero to two pi and that gives my full ring in space. I evaluate this and I get the value of the magnetic field. By the way, I don't know, and I'm sort of too lazy to check my book if this is squared or not. If it is squared, if it's not squared, then I would just do this, and then I would get another answer. Uh, I don't know where my book is right now, so uh, it's one of these two. I don't remember the field. I claim to be a physicist, but apparently I don't remember this formula. It's either squared or not. Um, I don't know, but anyways, it's either this or the other thing I showed. So SymPy can also take partial or directional derivatives, again, defining my symbols above. Uh, if I have an expression like this, well, the partial derivative is just the derivative of this expression with respect to x. So here I have y squared sine x plus y, and I just differentiate f with respect to x like I would normally, and I get the derivative, same thing with y. I can also do like uh, d cubed f dx um, dy squared. So here I differentiate with y twice, and then I differentiate with respect to x. And I get this formula here. So you can differentiate sort of in order like y, y, x. You can also do it with abstract symbols, right? So um, suppose x, y, and z are functions of t and w is a function of x, y, and z. So w equals w of x, y, z. x, y, y, and z are themselves functions of t. So here x equals x of t, y equals y of t, z equals z of t, and w equals w of x, y, z. So if I look at w, w is a function of x, which is a function of t, y of t, and z of t. I can differentiate with this with respect to t and it will automatically do the chain rule. So I get this whole expression here. Or I can substitute in specific functions. So here I have w1 as a specific function. So if I look at w1, it looks like this. w1. Complicated expression here where x is a function of t, y of t, z of t. I differentiate this with respect to t. So I can look at this. Of course, we don't know x and y yet, so it's still sort of complicated. Then I substitute, for example, x is sine t, y is cos t, z is t squared, and I make sure to call do it. So it actually does this integral, and I get a value like this. Of course, you can also do multiple integrals in SymPy. It's rare that you would do these because they rarely actually work, or they're rarely done uh, symbolically um, or analytically. Typically, you have to do these numerically, and that's sort of a NumPy thing or a SciPy thing. So here's a specific integral that can be done symbolically. Again, the difficulty of these isn't really the integral part. So it's not really used a lot, at least by myself in SymPy, but you can do it. And here I integrate F and my integral of Z goes from three. And I actually specify the bounds in terms of X and Y. And then Y goes from zero to one minus X squared and X goes from zero to one. And you'll note the order that I sort of pass these in when I'm doing this integral. My integrand is just x here, and I can find this integral. Now, I want to end this video with Lagrangian mechanics in SymPy because I think it's the best example of really showing the power of what SymPy can do for like abstract functions. So the simplified idea of Lagrangian mechanics is that kinetic energy and potential energy are expressed in terms of generalized coordinates. So Kinetic energy is a function of q and q dot, and the potential energy is a function of q and q dot. Dot represents derivative with respect to time. So the question is, what is q and what is q dot? These are sort of abstract coordinates. Well, q could be a, a x, y, z position of a particle, 
And so it's a function, maybe the kinetic energy is a function of where you are in space, x, y, z, and your velocity in space, x dot, y dot, and z dot, right? And if you're just in free space, then it's equal to uh, one half m x dot squared over two plus y dot squared over two plus z dot squared over two. So it's not even a function of x, y, and z in this case. But you might say, well, why would I define it then as q as some weird thing? Well, it can also be an abstract coordinate, like an angle theta for a pendulum. So maybe you say, what's the kinetic energy in terms of theta dot, which is the angular velocity of the pendulum. In this case, it's unitless. And so q is written like this because it can really be anything as long as it encapsulates information of the position, right? Theta encapsulates the position of the um, pendulum, but it's not an actual spatial thing, right? It's not like X, Y, or Z. So it's a coordinate, but it doesn't have units. Uh, same thing with the potential energy. So I, the, then you define something called the Lagrangian L, which is equal to T minus V. And the following equations of motion hold for all the different Qs. And that's the following. L will be a function of Q and Q dot. So DL dQ minus DDT of DL dQ dot is equal to zero. That's typical Lagrangian mechanics. And I'm going over this really fast. If you haven't taken a course in this, maybe this seems like pretty quick to go over it for all the different Qs, right? And the equation above will always give second order differential equations for the different Qs. And it will also give linear in terms of the second derivative. So whenever a second derivative shows up, when you plug in everything to this equation, you'll get a system of equations. But whenever the second derivative shows up, it always shows up as a linear factor. It's never squared or cubed or anything. That's the beauty of Lagrangian mechanics. It's sort of a second order derivative theorem here. Uh, so here I have an interesting problem. It's a cart on wheels and it sort of rolls back and forth and there's a pendulum attached to the bottom. So you can think as the pendulum swings, they're sort of oscillating in sort of back and forth directions, right? Because this goes left and maybe the pendulum swings right and then they sort of go back and forth like this. So there's two sort of generalized coordinates here, z and theta. You give me a value of z and a value of theta and the velocity in z and the velocity in theta and I know everything about that system, what's going on in that moment. Then I can solve the equations of motion and I know exactly how it moves after that. So here I want to find what these equations of motion are. Well, I'm going to let X, Y be the position of the pendulum bob for the time being. So my variables here are T for time. Uh, R is the length of the pendulum. G is gravity. M1 and M2. I define these symbols. Z and theta for now are abstract functions in time. So I define them as functions. Z equals Z of T and theta is equal to theta of T. So these are abstract functions. And I also define the derivatives dz dt and d theta dt. So I can look at um, z, for example, it's an abstract function, dz dt, it's an abstract sort of derivative like this, and I can define the location of the pendulum. Well, the x position of the pendulum is just z plus um, x. So x is equal to r sine theta, and y is equal to minus r cos theta. So these are my sort of position in x and y of the pendulum. Uh, the kinetic energies of the system our T1 is uh, 1 half M1 uh, Z dot squared, right? That's just the kinetic energy of the cart. Pendulum, 1 half M2, and I have my X dot squared plus Y dot squared. But it looks like these are X and Y, but remember that X and Y and sim pi are actually functions of theta. So everything here is a function of theta, my theta general coordinate. Uh, the total kinetic energy is the sum of these. Uh, the potential energy of the cart is always equal to zero. There's no gravitational potential, always at the same height. Whereas the pendulum is m2g times y. So that's like the potential energy of how this goes. If theta is equal to pi over two, y, uh, height y is equal to zero. If theta is equal to um, uh, zero, then the height is uh, minus r. And that's sort of what shows up here, uh, my total potential. And I can get my Lagrangian for the system, which looks like this. And of course it's abstract functions. And this is what's beautiful. So I can compute my Lagrange's equations of motion. So I have this, and this holds for Q, all values of Q. So it holds for Z and it holds for theta. So that's what I do here. I get my two Lagrangian equations, uh, DL DZ minus DDT of DL DZ dot. DZ dot, of course, is DZ DT. It's my first equation, complicated. Second one, and it holds for theta and it holds for Z. And I get my two Lagrange's equations, complicated functions like this. Uh, remember that this equals zero and this equals zero. That's how it returns these equations. That's essentially what it means. If I get my uh, solutions, 
Uh, maybe I want to find what d squared z dt squared is and d squared theta dt squared is. Because if I have my differential equations expressed in terms of the second order derivatives, then I can sort of solve them. So here I'm saying, well, I want explicitly, I want to solve these two equations and I want to solve for the second order um, derivative in z. And like I said, Lagrangian mechanics guarantees that as complicated as these expressions are, for example, here, the first derivative of theta is squared, um, there's cosine of theta and whatever, but the second order derivative will always show up as a linear factor, shows up as a linear factor here, linear factor here and theta and z. And so I have a system of linear equations, which is really easy to solve, you know, if you're dealing with simple ones, but this is a system of linear equations, two equations, two second order derivatives. So it's a system of linear equations in the second derivatives. You want to solve that by hand, not going to be very fun. Simpy makes it easy, right? So I solve these two equations and I want to find the second order derivative in Z and the second order derivative in theta. And I get my solutions. It takes a little bit and I get them. And it returns it as sort of like a dictionary. So in this dictionary, if I want to find the second order derivative in Z, I need to pass that into uh, like a dictionary, right? So I say, I want my solution for the second order derivative in theta. So D squared theta DT squared is equal to this. Then I want my solution for the second order derivative in Z. And I find it like this. And that's my solution here. And so with these two second order differential equations, I can then solve this system numerically. And like I said, that's not the focus of the video. I have plenty of videos in Lagrangian mechanics for solving these equations. And then for example, plotting the motion of a system. It's not the goal of this video. If you want to see the system solved, I can certainly do it in a later video. But I think with the knowledge that you have, if you watch my other videos, you'll certainly be able to solve this system. Anyways, I hope you enjoy this video. I really hope it's useful that you can now go in your own physics courses. And you know, when you have a complicated mathematical expression, you can solve it by hand, it's easy. And furthermore, that you can watch my other videos for tons of practice in using SimPy. I have tons of videos in Lagrangian mechanics on this channel and every video where there's complicated mathematical expressions involved, I typically use SimPy. So if you want more practice, and again, the key to learning this stuff is to practice it, use it in your courses, you know, do it by hand by yourself. Um, it will seem more difficult at first. It's like that chemical potential where you have to put in a lot of effort to learn it. And then as soon as you get it, everything becomes easy. I never really struggle with math in the courses that I'm taking anymore. Cause whenever I find some complicated integral, I just go to SimPy and I plug it in. Of course you can do this in Wolfram alpha, but when you start getting complicated things, for example, like the hydrogen atom in this video, you don't want to do that every time in Wolfram alpha. Please be sure to subscribe, check out my NumPy tutorial, my SciPy tutorial, and Matplotlib tutorial as well. Anyways, I'll see you next time.